The Buddha wasn't the sort of person who went out to look for people to argue with in general. But there are a couple of cases where he would actually seek out teachers and ask them about their teaching because they heard they taught things that were really detrimental. And one group of teachers was the group that said that your actions don't make any difference. Everything you experience right now is determined from the past, either from what God has decreed or from past actions. Another group were those who said that there is no cause and effect in the world. Things just happen randomly. Your actions don't make any difference. In all those cases, he criticized those teachers because they were irresponsible. They were neglecting the two duties of a teacher, which is to help the student learn how not to be bewildered, because after all, we are all bewildered by suffering. If we want to find a way out of suffering, we have to get past that bewilderment. And also, he said they leave them unprotected. And he explained that. He said it means that they didn't give any basis for saying that something should or should not be done. After all, if it was we determined that it was going to happen, how could you say it shouldn't be done? It was going to be done willy-nilly anyway, and you're in no position to make it, make a choice. Precisely that, depriving people of the basis for making a choice as to what should and should not be done, that's what leaves them unprotected. Nowadays, there's another teaching that also leaves people unprotected, and that's the teaching of non-duality, that good and evil are basically the same. But there is no basis for saying that one action is good or another action is evil. And this teaching on non-duality has made its way into Buddhism. In fact, I was reading just the other day a teacher saying that when the Buddha was teaching the Four Noble Truths, he was coming from a position of non-duality, which doesn't make any sense at all. If there's any number that's dual, it's four. It's dual duality. And it's there precisely because the Buddha is trying to fulfill his duty as a teacher, his responsibility as a teacher, which is to give you a basis for deciding what should and should not be done. After all, we're all active creatures. Our minds are active. We're not simply sitting here passively observing the world and asking as an idle pastime, oh, what is the nature of the world? How does the world act? We have to know how the world acts because we're active. We're pulling the levers all the time. Every moment we're engaged in the act of fabrication. And it's because we do it with lack of skill that we're suffering. And that's the problem the Buddha wants to solve. And so as long as you realize that suffering is one thing and not suffering is something else, then you decide that you really want to stop suffering. You've got to think in dualities. And it is your protection. It's what discernment is all about. The Buddha said, you start discernment by noticing what in the mind is skillful, what in the mind is not skillful. And then you develop greater and greater refinement in understanding what's skillful and not. And in that way you protect yourself. You have a basis for making that decision. If you believe that actions didn't have any effect, or everything were predetermined, or there's no real distinction between good and evil. You're left unprotected in two ways. One, you have no basis at all for even thinking that there should be something I should and I should not. And you don't have any basis for deciding what would be. And the Buddha is trying to provide you with precisely those two things, pointing out that certain actions lead to suffering, are skillful, are blameless. Other actions lead in the other direction. And then gives you the tools for figuring out which is which. In some cases, he simply gives you the precepts. And these are questions you don't have to test. 
No killing, no stealing, no illicit sex, no lying, no taking intoxicants. He said those issues have been tested. You can, you can simply follow the precepts, and you can clear up a lot of issues in life. That allows you to look deeper into the mind. Because there are a lot of issues that are not covered by the precepts, things you might do or not do, things you might say or not say, and particularly things you might think or not think. You've got to decide whether they're worth doing or not. In fact, discernment is a value judgment in that way, giving you a basis for deciding what is worth doing, what's not worth doing. Like right now, we've decided that meditation is something that's worth doing. That implies that our actions make a difference, and because our actions come from our intentions, our intentions come from our minds, it is worthwhile to train the mind. And so everyone get the mind really still. So you can see when it moves, is its movement skillful or not? And as you get deeper into the processes of the mind, you begin to see these acts of fabrication, bodily fabrication, breath, verbal fabrication, directed thought and evaluation, in other words, the way you talk to yourself, and the mental fabrication, feelings and perceptions, feelings of pleasure or pain, neither pleasure nor pain, that kind of feeling. And then the perceptions are the labels you apply to things. All of these things are actions. And they can take you in different directions. Take perception, for instance, the way you perceive a particular part of the body, the way you perceive an action in the mind, is going to determine what you do with it. For instance, if there's a pattern of tension in the body, if you see it simply as a solid part of the body, there's nothing much you can do with it. For years I had a blockage in my back, and I thought it was because there was a bone there. And so I simply accepted the fact that it was there. And then I went in for an osteopathic treatment one time, and the doctor released the tension, and it turned out it was a muscle, not a bone. And I suddenly realized I could now breathe with that part of my body, I could move that part of the body. When you see these things as breath, there are lots of things you can do with them. If you see them simply as a solid lump or a bone, there's not much you can do. So your perceptions will change things, your range of what you can do. And so some are skillful and some are not. This is why we have to develop a right view, is to get a sense of what perceptions will be skillful, what ways of perceiving ourselves, what ways of perceiving the problem of suffering. Well, it should be conducive to put an end to suffering. And why is putting an end to suffering a skillful thing? Because as long as you're suffering, you're going to cause other people suffering. That's when you've learned how not to cause yourself any suffering. That's when you don't have to cause anybody else any suffering. Because as we're suffering, we're feeding, both physically and emotionally, more importantly, emotionally and mentally. And if we don't get our food, we get pretty desperate. And there are lots of very unskillful things we can do because we have this inner hunger. But if you can find the part of the mind that doesn't need to feed, then it places no burden on anyone at all. So there are shoulds and should nots. When the Buddha taught the Four Noble Truths, he immediately taught the shoulds that went along with them. Suffering should be comprehended, which means that you look at the clinging, look at what you're clinging to, and realize that it's not worth it. 
That means you have to look at the cause of suffering, which is the craving that says it's very much worth it. You have to develop the path so you can abandon the craving and then realize the cessation. Those are the shoulds. And making this distinction between what should and should not be done. That's basic to any worthwhile act of teaching. The Buddha himself, although there are lots of issues that he would not take a position on, did come down hard on people who would not take a position on the question of what is skillful and what's not. Some people, he said, were afraid to take a position for fear they might be defeated. Other people, he said, were just totally confused and thought it was clever to say there is no such thing as right or wrong, good or evil. Or the idea you just go around floating around without taking a position is kind of a cool thing. He said that was utter stupidity. So although there are some dichotomies or some dualities that the Buddha said he avoided, call them extremes. The dichotomy and the duality of suffering and not suffering, what should be done, what should not be done, what is skillful to do, what is not skillful to do, that was important duality to keep always in mind. And that's his gift to us. Because it does allow us to be protected. I've been reading about people being abused by their teachers in those traditions where they teach non-duality, and you see how the teaching on non-duality lends itself so easily to playing mind games on people. Their normal defenses are down, and then the teachers abuse them. It was only when someone came in from the outside and said, look, this is abuse, that they finally came to their senses. So realizing that there are dualities is your protection. It's the beginning of your protection. And then when you see what is a, the distinction between what's skillful and what is not, what is, should be done and what should not be done, and you refine your dis discernment around those issues, that's when you end your bewilderment. That's when you're really protected. One of the aspects of the Buddhist teachings that's underappreciated is the fact that it's a very safe teaching. And then it gives safety all around. You follow his teachings and you will never, because of that act, have to suffer. You'll never go to a bad destination. It's only when we try to change the teachings into something we think is more clever. That's when we're left unprotected. The act of trying to be clear about what is dharma and what is not dharma, what is skillful and what is not, it's basic to the whole practice, and it's basic to keeping you safe.